Hello and welcome to Best Sips Worldwide. I'm your drinking companion, Susan Schwartz, an American travel writer living in London. Thanks to my mother's love of martinis, the first words I spoke were shaken, not stirred, and I've been obsessed by the history of cocktails ever since. Through the years, I've been lucky enough to sip some of the best made by the best. Hear that sound? It's time to cozy up to the bar and let me introduce you to the movers and shakers of the world's most famous watering holes. There's one wine that comes with rules. It must be decanted, the decanter must be passed to the left, and you must never forget to put that said decanter back in its hogget. How did port from Portugal become so English? Our next guest, Anna Margarita Margado of Taylor's Port, gives us a brief history of this festive beverage that goes so well with Stilton. Port is this amazing wine that comes from the Douro Valley. Uh, Port is um, a fortified wine that, due to the unique characteristics of the Douro Valley, that is a, an area with a very uh, Mediterranean climate, with very hot summers, cold winters, and a, a very low rainfall, produces grapes that are very concentrated in color, very aromatic, and very uh, and the, uh, big longevity. They give wines with great longevity. We do not irrigate the grapes, so uh, the vines. So the grapes, they, are, they have an immense concentration and they are full of sugar. So it means that the wines that are produced from these grapes are full-bodied wines, wines with great longevity. Over the time, and we are talking the business of port started in the mid end of the 17th century because the English that were so uh, dedicated to the French wine, the wine from Bordeaux, they, due to the very difficult uh, uh, relations between these two countries, they had to find wine in other countries. And Portugal was not only a very old ally from, from the, the, the English, uh, but also a very good wine producing country. And Porto, the town of Porto, was very close to England. And at the town of Porto arrived quite easily the wines from the Douro Valley. The Douro Valley is quite far from Porto, but at like a motorway that co- that is called the Douro River. So the wines made in the Douro Valley were tra- traveled down through the Douro River to the town of Porto and then were shipped to England. We can say that um, in the exceptional years, so it means the very hot and dry years, the wines were, the, the grapes were so full of sugar, so, so dry, that day naturally will uh, would produce sweet wines why because the alcohol produced by the yeasts was so much that the yeast would kill themselves without transforming all the sugar from the grape so at, in these exceptional years the wines were sweet and strong in alcohol in these were the years that the British would pay better because they were full-bodied and very strong. They were what was used to call at the time fiery like a gun, sweet like Brazil, spicy like India, and hinky uh, like a hink to write. These were the exceptional years. Of course, there is not every year that is give, give these wines. And so it was over the time discovered that if we fortify halfway the fermentation happens, we finish with a sweet and alcoholic wine. And that was the uh, more at the taste of the English. And this happened because frequently the Douro Valley produces very sweet and dry grapes due to the climate of due to the terroir of the Douro Valley that is a Mediterranean climate with an amazing soil that is a stone this schist that the main characteristic is that doesn't retain water 
and I guess Mr. Beardsley, who began t- what we call Taylor's now, just happened to be at the right place at the right time, drinking that wine and thought, hey, you know, That's this, right. I, I could export this. So yeah. why don't you tell us a little bit of the history of Taylor's? Taylor's. That's where we are right now. Yes, yeah, so Taylor's started um, in 1692 with this uh, e- English gentleman called uh, Job Beersley. He was a uh, wool merchant, but also had an inn in, Long- in London. So he traded in wine and also in uh, um in wool, uh, but he became more and more, uh, uh, and and very soon after, a uh, sole wine merchant. Um, he was a very brave man to start this, but like many other uh, English shippers at the time, but he was since the beginning committed to buy the best wines and by the mid of the 18th century the competition between the english shippers was already already very big to have the best wines at the best price so bartholomew beersley that was the grandson of mr beersley uh, uh, will do a very important thing he goes to the Doro valley and buys a vineyard in the Doro valley and this sense oh, so before mr beersley didn't own a vineyard he was only no. buying yeah and by what, like so it was like, really his grandson yes yes who made and, a difference and yeah that that's that's it because at the time uh, what was the the, the 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 common thing was the the shippers would come uh, in spring to buy the wines and then to ship but the business was uh, all happened in, in in england not not so much in mm-hmm. portugal so in portugal were the producers that were the portuguese in the doro valley and so when when the grandson of Mr. Beasley buys the vineyard, it was the first vineyard bought by a non-Portuguese uh, uh, in the Douro Which Valley. Which shows a real commitment a to real the country. Commitment. To... And when you think that the, uh, uh, the other shippers mm-hmm. only, only bought vineyards in the Douro Valley one century and a half after. Mm-hmm. So you, it really shows how in advance, how early Taylor's was, and this only because of one thing. He wanted to be the first to taste the best wines and be able to buy the best wines. So mm-hmm. since the beginning a commitment to quality and also a passion for the region because it's not... Um, Still today, it's not immediate to go to the Doro Valley. You have to cross the mountains. Today is a little bit easier because we have the town, the tunnel through the mountains since three months ago. But imagine in the 18th century, it really showed that uh, a commitment and a very strong will to to be different. I guess it was all done on the Doro River, really, up and back, up and back. Yes, and it was not yeah, the as transport, calm yeah. as it is today at all. At all it was uh-huh. a very, very tortuous ter- uh, river with a lot lots of rapids uh, and uh, very hard to to navigate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But so then Taylor's is an history of passion and dedication and and family, family uh, business. Then um, uh, joins the business uh, Mr. Taylor's that also it's the person, very important person that will give the name to the company as we we know it today. And what century was that? Uh, Mid mid 19th century. century. Uh, Beginning of the 19th century, sorry. And then it's only in the mid of the 19th century that the name of the company uh, 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 Becomes unchanged, and it's the same name that is today. That is Taylor Fladgate and the Eightman, mm-hmm. and for short, the brand name is just Taylor's. Mm-hmm. Or in North American markets, we are known as Taylor Fladgate. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so then it joined the partnership, the the uh, the Fladgate family and the Eightmans, both very important and very passionate by, by, for the Doro Valley and also for the viticulture of the Doro, Doro Valley. For instance, um, Mr. Fladgate was made a baron by the King of Portugal but because of all his effort to bring knowledge to the region to fight the diseases that arrived to the Doro Valley in the, in the 19th century that were the oidium, mildium, and then in the end, phylloxera. And he was a very active did, protector. What happened? Did they 
kill the the vines? Uh, yes, uh, Ovidium and Mildium still are present, and uh -huh. Phylloxera as well. But at the time, was uh, we didn't know the the cure to to to, to these diseases. Not only in the Douro, but all all over the the, the viticultural uh, mm -hmm. regions, uh, the um, the region. So he was he traveled uh, quite frequently to France to see what the French were, were doing and also to change knowledge. And then when he came from these trips, he used to write letters to the to the Doro farmers to ch to share the knowledge uh -huh. and imagine the Doro farmers are not not a, an English gentleman they, right. they and so they, they, they were, really cared they about really cared about that and the that, industry as a whole not just yeah yeah you know, not just own, his own his own, uh -huh. his own company um, and then the, the 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 floodgates are really the the, the sole owners of tailors in the in the 20th century and they uh, they are amazing by doing for instance the first plantations in the Douro Valley after the phylloxera that is done by varieties really to increase the knowledge for each Douro grape varieties at the Douro Valley has many different grape varieties but some were less known than others and so the the first block plantation in the Douro Valley is done by Mr. Yateman and also to create new wines. That is the, the case of the, 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 the extra dry white port from Taylor's that created the category. And then later on, uh, Mr. Robertson, so the, 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 the descendant of the, the Yatemans, he creates slate bottle vintage that was really a revolution to the, to the port trade that today is the best seller port wine in terms of quality port. Well, let's go back to that. You brought up white port. So can you just do a quick um, recap of the different ports that are there? Because there's all these names, vintage, tawny, um, late bottled, white, rosé. What, um, at Taylor's, what are the different names and kind of versions of each of them maybe you can yeah, just it, educate me on that that's not easy i <laughs> totally agree port wine has many uh, different categories many different styles so first division we can say there are white ports and red ports okay white ports are made from white grapes in terms of vinification is the same so if they ferment uh, a short period in order to uh, remain uh, some sugar in the final wine. But in the case of white ports, do dry ports, we can do a little bit longer fermentation in order to have a drier port. So they're also white grapes then? White grapes, yeah. The uh -huh. white grapes are mainly planted in the top of the hills in the Douro Valley, okay. where it's not so hot. The white grapes don't need so much heat like the red grapes to mature. So the white grapes, and they existed, existed since always in the Douro Valley. Um, and so there are white grapes for white ports and red mm -hmm. grapes for red ports. It's just to say that the white ports are mainly young ports, sweeter or drier, according to how long we allow them to, to, to ferment always with some residual sugar because port wine is always sweet mm -hmm. less or more sweet but always sweet uh, we never allow the grapes to ferment until the end to be a port wine and so white port is really an aperitif uh, it's a very elegant very uh, also structured wine it is not a light uh, wine but yet it has structure it has very uh, uh, very uh, very big elegance the Again, the, the white grapes and the, the red grapes are uh, natural to the Douro Valley, are local uh, uh, grape varieties with some uh, complicated uh, names, uh, but some of the Portuguese, uh, the, the Douro grape varieties are uh, Rabigato, Viozinho, Codega, Malvasia, just to, to give some names. Then there are the red grapes. Red grapes are all, also a big selection of gra uh, red grapes authorized for port, all local varieties. We can say that there are uh, around 40 different grape varieties that you can use for port. And in most of the old vines in the Douro Valley, there, are, there is a very big mix of grape varieties in the in the, the in the vineyards, but then so all port wine is done 
the same way for red ports with the same amount, same, the same sweetness, uh, we say around uh, 80 grams of, sh of uh, sugar per liter, but then it's the aging, the different types of aging of the red ports that will give different styles. And so if the port wines are very full-bodied wines, I will put them in big oak. Uh, wooden vats for around five years and they will be ruby ports or if they are from one single year they will be late bottled vintage so late bottle vintage in terms of complexity is a step up from the ruby ports but both wines are full-bodied wines with a lot of um, uh, fruit, uh, fruity aromas. So it means that they match perfectly strong flavors. Okay, chocolate, dark chocolates, desserts with uh, with uh, red fruits and strong, strong desserts. And then of course cheese. Cheese. Right, we're going to talk about cheese about, in a second. Right? All right. Very well. So <laughs> hold on. If I put my port wine to age in smaller casks, so around six hundred liter cask, um, I will allow my wine to be much more exposed to the air, through the wood of course, than if I put in a big vat like the Ruby and LBV. So the port wines that age in smaller casks, they will become tawny ports. Okay. Okay, that is All the right. only difference. Okay. Initially it's the same wine, but if I age in big wooden vats with small short contact with the air, they will become ruby port or LBV. If I age in smaller wooden casks, they will be exposed through the wood to the air. They lose the ruby color, they gain a more amber and, and golden. How long before one is a tawny port? Tony port, a, a standard Tony port can be around from the very basic three, three year old, to seven year old, and then 10, 20, 30, four, and 40 year old. Okay, and then vintage. And then vintage port is another thing. Vintage port only happens in exceptional years, and it's the only port wine that ages in the bottle. So, so mean, no oxygen, no right? oxygen. That's uh -huh. it. So it's a it's a wine that, uh, of course, we want to uh, separate from because it's really only is done when the conditions are exceptional, meaning that can age in the bottle for decades or sometimes centuries. You can open a bottle immediately but you can wait 10 20 50 100 years live to the next generation but you can open immediately it's not it means that is an exceptional wine since the moment we bottle and then you almost can forget it in, okay in the since you brought up cheese I always say that at least in the UK port and Stilton is kind of like captain and Tennille they go together obviously um, Stilton is an English cheese so in Portugal what would you have the, the those ports with? Is there a special cheese or special chocolate? What if someone were coming to Portugal? What would you suggest that they have that port with? Yeah, we have, we are uh, maybe you don't know, but uh, maybe it is quite surprising. But we are a cheese country. We have many many different types of cheese, many appellations, but maybe we have a a cheese that is. Mm, maybe the king of cheese, that's called queijo da serra. Um, and uh, this, this, this cheese is made with, with sheep milk. Um, and um, it has a very big intensity, um, beautiful consistency, and it goes very well with, with vintage ports. Um, so uh, we can say that is maybe the best pairing between uh, uh, vintage port and a Portuguese cheese is uh, Taylor's vintage with the queijo da serra. Well, that's what I'm having next. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with us. I really, really appreciate it. And um, let's go try some port. Thank you. Let's go. Let's go. It was so great of Anna to be with us this week as we report from Porto. Check out bestbitsworldwide.com this week for more stories on Portugal. Next up, we fly up into the air with Phileas Fogg's Italian relative Filippo Previero, head barman of Mr. Fogg's Tavern in London, the Covent Garden Pied a Terre of the Generati. Until next time, bottoms up. 
For more information and links to everything you've heard about, plus a bit more, please visit bestbitsworldwide.com. Thanks for listening to Best Sips Worldwide, a spin-off of Best Bits Worldwide. Always remember the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation, and never drink and drive. Okay, I said that last part. Theme music is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. You'll find me at the bar. Bye.